You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hello, everyone. My name is Wesley Livesey from the History of the Second World War podcast. My podcast is a mostly chronological retelling of the Second World War, starting not with the beginning of the war itself, but almost two decades earlier, to try and determine why and how the nations of the world would find themselves in a worldwide conflict just 20 years after the devastation of the First World War. You can find History of the Second World War on all major podcast platforms or at historyofthesecondworldwar.com. Two orange rectangles on a canvas, each of them gaseous. You can't tell where the edges are. They seem to bleed into the white border that surrounds them. So step into Bert Cooper's office. Take your shoes off first and stare at the Rothko painting. What do you see? Yes, indeed. I'm going to talk about Mad Men, the TV show that just ended a little bit today, including the question of, well, did he or didn't he? And if he did, what does it mean? That viewers of the program will understand. Why not? Never has a TV series been so much like a history class, taught us so much about a period of American history and culture in which there were profound societal changes. And never has a TV show been so artful in its attention to detail and in a way revealing about how we can even view history. I'll talk about all that. But first, I don't ask you to buy the world a Coke. But if you do like the program, consider donating. You can do that at www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. The archive to My History Can Beat Up Your Politics, where we have most of the episodes that we've recorded since 2006 for access to that suggested donation, it's $25. Thank you to those who have donated. Before we get into TV shows... We have a Republican primary on our hands, so it's useful to think about another one. January 1980, the Iowa caucuses, in a bid for publicity, do a straw poll of all of the caucus members to attract attention. The straw poll is among the presidential candidates. That year in 1980, it's clear that Ronald Reagan is the frontrunner. Former governor of California, he had challenged Gerald Ford. Sitting president in 1976 and almost won the nomination then. Four years later, he's the front runner. It doesn't seem like anyone could take him on, but people try. And most prominent among them is George H. W. Bush. And then we would have just said George Bush, former ambassador to China, former CIA director, former congressman from Texas, moderate Republican. His whole career, he says he's fought against extreme right-wingers in the Republican Party, as he calls them the Birch stuff, referring to the John Birch Society of that time. And it's odd as to why George Bush is running. He's not never a popular favorite. His electoral experience was in the 60s. He lost an election in Texas, Senate election, to Lloyd Benson in 1970. Couldn't carry his own state. It might have been some personal grudges that got him in. He had been passed up for the VP nomination in 1976. After Gerald Ford lost the election, he went to Carter and said, look, I know we're different parties, but I'm CIA director. It would help you to just extend me in that term. Carter refuses, wants his own man in there. He announces he's going to start running for president. It's not a big deal, but he works Iowa. Jimmy Carter had taught people this lesson in 76. Iowa's the first caucus, and it sends a message. So he has 50 volunteers all over the state, another 300 people in Virginia making phone calls to Iowa. He travels around in a Learjet visiting towns in Iowa. Reagan had been seen as the front runner, but he doesn't go to Iowa much, and doesn't think George Bush is really an important opponent. He thinks his opponent is former Texas governor, former Treasury Secretary John Connolly, who's also running in 1980. Reagan doesn't attend a debate where all the other candidates do, and they attack him for not coming to Iowa as much as they attack President Carter. Reagan 
decides to call in on an Iowa radio station. And it's one that when he was a radio broadcaster, he used to work on. He figures he'll get favorable treatment. He does not. They ask him tough questions. But especially, he's hammered for not coming to Iowa more. Even so, he's the national front runner in 1980. So even without appearing there a lot, he has a strong showing in the Iowa caucuses and in the straw poll that they do of the caucus members. But George Bush narrowly edges him out by two percentage points. It's not the Iowa result so much that matters. In fact, Iowa's caucus lead to a state convention that happens later. And by the time that state convention happens months later, they're all going to be for Reagan. But in the straw poll, Bush won, gets 2% more, and the media is on fire. Bush breaks out of the pack, says Newsweek, which a big, with a big picture of his face. A big setback for Reagan. Impressive for Bush, the Washington Post says. Odds are now coming out that Bush is the favorite to win the nomination and that Reagan is done. But those of us who have watched these primaries come and go know better, right? <laughs> First thing Bush does is make a, a big mistake right after Iowa. He's figuring out my family's from New England. I'll do even better in the New Hampshire primary. I won in Iowa. And I'm not even from there. The headlines go out. Bush says he'll win New Hampshire primary. Now you've just set expectations very, very high. And some big mistakes you're going to make. For the biggest one is that George Bush tries to get a debate alone with Reagan. And Reagan also initially wants that debate to be alone. So the Nashua Telegraph sponsors a debate, but the newspaper says, look, we're not going to have a debate with just the two of you. We want all the candidates in. And Reagan says, that's fine. I will pay for the debate. I want a chance to debate Bush, this seeming front runner now, who has, you know, outlapped me one on one. So there's a brief and seemingly unimportant event that nobody at the event really understood would have any impact on the race. Just last a few seconds. That makes history. It's decided that all the candidates can participate, even though Reagan's sponsoring the event. But when Reagan gets there and Bush gets there, there are two chairs. The Nashua Telegraph had decided that the debate was just for these two candidates. Everyone's confused. The audience is confused. But Reagan... Former baseball announcer, former actor, knows how to improv. And he wasn't confused about what he should do here. He goes up to the stage to explain to the crowd that there's a delay while they're sorting this out and why there's a delay. At this point, one of the editors of the Nashua newspaper thinks it's unfair that Reagan should talk while the others aren't talking yet, while it's being sorted out. And he shouts to the sound men, turn Mr. Reagan's microphone off. Well... Reagan says, I didn't like that. We were paying the freight for the debate, and he was acting as if his newspaper was still sponsoring it. I turned to him with the microphone still on, and the first thing that came to my mind, I'm paying for this microphone, Mr. Green. Forget that his name was Mr. Breen. The crowd goes wild, and it just seems like a stand that... Reagan's taking that somehow had something to do with Bush, even though it didn't, really. For this and other reasons, I mean, one of, the, one of the big supporters of Reagan in New Hampshire is going to be the Manchester Union, a fairly conservative newspaper. They're going to attack Bush. They called the Iowa result a CIA operation, that Bush is a member of the Trilateral Commission and all of this stuff, and they, they heavily support Reagan. That helps him in Manchester, New Hampshire. He wins 50% of the vote in the 1980 New Hampshire primary. March 10th, 1980 issue of Time says, Ronnie's Romp. Bush stays in it until May, and he wins four primaries, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. Connolly doesn't win a single state. He's beaten in South Carolina, drops out. An interesting thing goes on now, especially if you consider where the Bush family is now. Two presidents, a third Bush possibly running for president dynasty in politics, and yet it's all kind of accidental in a way, and so nearly never happened. 
this wasn't a family that had a long, you know, vestige. I mean, of course, Prescott Bush, the grandfather, was involved in, in politics. But now something else happens that's going to really determine the future of George Bush and the Bush family. You get to the convention in Detroit in 1980. Reagan's easily nominated. What he really wants at this point is to bring former President Ford in as his vice president. Mix the moderate wings, conservative wing of the party, have a big name, a former president, bring in the competence of someone who's had the office, who knows the office, but yet was unelected. Ford actually kind of likes this idea of jumping back into the political ring, but he doesn't like being Reagan's second in command. And he has a couple of negotiators and some of the names you're going to know, Alan Greenspan, Dick Cheney, who go to the Reagan people and say, we can make this happen, but it's got to be more like a co-presidency. For instance, we want some control over foreign policy. And probably I'm going to want Henry Kissinger to become Secretary of State again. The Reagan people are uncomfortable with this. They'll offer the vice presidency to Gerald Ford. They'll give him the kinds of assurances that modern presidents have been giving vice presidential nominees all along now. I'll involve you in meetings. I'll consider your advice. The Ford team wants more. The Reagan team doesn't want to give it. That falls apart. Now, even there, there are people that are more well-known than George Bush. So Howard Baker, for instance, polls higher when they do a quick poll to determine who they might pick for the VP nomination. But Bush had run in the primaries. He did represent enough of the other wing of the Republican Party. And he's from Texas. Texas is a big state. Jimmy Carter had won Texas in 76. It's hard to imagine a Democrat winning Texas. Well, it hasn't happened since. Stayed in contention in 1980. And because of that, Bush is put on the vice presidential ticket and runs for president on his own in 1988. Eric Atkinson writes, With the exceptions of 1964 and maybe 1980, I can't think of any GOP primaries in the last 60-plus years where the big money establishment favorite lost to a more conservative insurgent candidate. This election has the makings of another potential exception. What are your thoughts? Um... I think there's some truth to it, and I really do think that in 1980, Reagan was almost establishment, even though he was conservative. He was seen by so many as the front runner. There was a lot of support for George Bush, particularly after he won Iowa. He was starting to get a lot of corporate support. But both Connolly and Bush were less organized, had less successful campaigns, and they just weren't serious after a month or so. And after New Hampshire, it really wasn't a serious threat anymore. 1964 is an interesting example. I think even though Barry Goldwater was a bit of an insurgent, one of the things that's not well known is that Goldwater almost ran in 1960, and his campaign was talked down by the Nixon people. And uh, there was a play, though, for him to run in 1960, and he personally, Goldwater, decided not to do it, that he wouldn't accept it. So there'd been a lot of talk to him, you know, from the late 50s when he was a budget critic, conservative stalwart, to 1960 when Nixon ran. And so by 1964, he had the superior organization, even though he was a bit of an insurgent. That's what happened in that election. Yeah, I can't say anything happened since then. Of course, there's 76 where Reagan came awfully close. In 2015, I think we could be making too much of the dividing line between the establishment And the Tea Party wings, I mean, they've always been there. Goldwater, Rockefeller, Taft and Eisenhower back in 52. And I think that there are kind of some candidates that blend a little bit of this, like establishment and conservative, that could appeal to both. And I would put like a Rubio or a Walker in both places, maybe Kasich if he decides to jump in. Jeb Bush has made some mistakes, but... American politics loves that, you know, second story, the comeback. So I could see these where uh, someone else becomes front runner, has a little run, and then Bush gets back in it. But if he wants to stay in it, he's got to get better. Ryan Dotson asks, have there ever been this many declared candidates, either Republican or Democrat before? The field is so large, even a front runner right now has a relatively small fraction of the attention. 
Thanks, Ryan. I, I think it's large, but it's early. And not everybody's declared that's being talked about, and it will settle down. The past elections also featured some large fields. Look at uh, 1988 on the Democratic side. You had Gore, Dukakis, Gephardt, Babbitt, Paul Simon, guy with the bow tie, and Jesse Jackson, the seven dwarfs they were called. Even in 1980, on the Republican side, where it was pretty clear that Reagan was the front runner, you had a lot of other names. You had uh, Connolly, Bush, Reagan, Howard Baker of Tennessee, John Anderson, Illinois, another congressman from Illinois, Phil Crane also ran, and Bob Dole. There's a few other candidates that were mentioned at times, but never declared. So when the primaries start, I think then as now, candidates lose and they start to drop out. I know people are thinking that the campaign cash from the super PACs and what Citizen United have created will change that factor. But I'm not so sure. I think like anything else, money, even big money, will tend to focus in on a few candidates and most of the money will go where there's a reasonable chance to win. I think that the Midwest is such an obvious target for Republicans now. Can't rule out someone like Scott Walker, uh, either as a presidential candidate or let's say Jeb Bush is able to get the nomination as a vice presidential candidate. The GOP has been targeting this area, the Rust Belt, for a while. It is part of its strategy. A winning GOP combination doesn't have to involve it, but really should involve Wisconsin, Minnesota, Ohio, or two of those three. Obama has won Minnesota and Wisconsin really with the help of uber turnout in the cities. And it's going to be interesting to see if Democrats can repeat it in 2016. It's clouded the fact that prior to these elections, Wisconsin was very close in 2004. In 2000, Wisconsin was desperately close for Gore. So that's the reason I come back to Walker. I also think that there's that issue Bush has with the dynasty in a party that's a little skeptical of that. The GOP kind of likes the the blue-collar everyman, and Walker's a person that that is at least trying to represent that. There's the theory that you don't always go for the state, although Wisconsin is an important state, adding to the Electoral College, but you go for the region. And I don't think anyone else talks about this, but I brought it up before. President Obama, first African-American president, but also the first Midwestern president we've had in some time. And I know it's not commonly thought of this way, but, you know, when you're the senator from Illinois and a rising star in Illinois, you're getting a lot of coverage in Indiana, which he did carry in the 2008 election. You're getting coverage in the other areas. It helped him, for instance, in Iowa to be from a neighboring state. You're You're in touch with certain issues. I think in Obama's case, the ethanol issue helped. So I think that candidates from one state can help to pull in neighboring states, particularly where media coverage kind of bleeds across state lines. That kind of leads me to walk around one part of the ticket or another, at least right now. We'll see how things go. Okay, well, from real history to a mix of real history and fiction, the closing of the series Mad Men watched by 4.5 million viewers, including myself, within the first three days. Uh, What they call live plus three. In other words, all the people watching it, all the people that watched it within three days, including DVR. That's how ratings are done now. It's what advertisers expect now. You get 4.5 million viewers, according to AMC, the network that hosts the series. It's funny in a way because how, how different... Americans are than than where their television watching used to be. Compare that to MASH, when the series added 125 million viewers, the most for a finale ever. Cheers, 93 million viewers. Seinfeld, 76 million viewers. Even Everybody Loved Raymond came in at 32 million. That alone makes a statement about how we aren't all watching the same things. At least at the same time, because I'm sure some will watch that finale later and later in a way that they probably would never see the MASH finale for many years if they didn't see it that night. First, the real part. In 1971, Bill Backer, the creative director on the Coca-Cola account for McCain Erickson, was traveling to London 
to join some songwriters to arrange some jingles for the Coca-Cola company. The plane approaches Britain, and there's heavy fog at London's Heathrow Airport. The plane is forced to land at Shannon Airport in Ireland. Uh, the passengers that he's with, he noticed, they're just a rate because there's only one hotel. Everybody's got to share rooms. It wasn't a good scene. Customers are yelling, etc. But what could you do? And the next morning, Backer notices that the passengers are in the airport coffee shop, awaiting clearance to fly. And they, they've calmed down now. And several of them, who had been among the most irate, are sitting there laughing and sharing stories with each other over a bottle of Coke. Here's what Backer says. In that moment, I began to see a bottle of Coca-Cola as more than a drink. Let's have a Coke was actually a subtle way of saying, let's keep each other company for a while. And so Backer told him that they should start working. Instead of on the jingle planned, they should work on the idea he had. I could see and hear a song that treated the whole world as if it were a person. A person the singer would like to help and get to know. I'm not sure how the lyric would start, but I know the last line. Pulls out a paper napkin on which he had scribbled the line, I'd like to buy the world a Coke and keep it company. It's released in 1971. The ad is a huge dramatic hit. Coca-Cola, its bottlers get more than 100,000 letters about the ad. The demand for the song is so strong that radio stations are getting called to play the commercial, so they have to release a single. I'd like to buy the world a Coke. And they do. Well, this is a spoiler alert, so turn it off right now if you don't want to hear. Only in the internet age do I have to give a spoiler alert so long after the program. But that's how it ends with that classic Coke commercial from 1971. The implication is that the main character, Don Draper, had designed the ad, although that's the subject of some controversy I'll talk about. The name of the show is called Person to Person, and it features Don Draper and three person-to-person calls that he completes with women in his life. His daughter Sally, ex-wife Betty, the copy director he hired, Peggy Olson. Person-to-person call is an old operator assistance service the telephone company used to do where you call a person and the calling party wants to speak to a specific person and not simply anyone who answers in the household. If the operator is not able to reach that person, you're not charged for the call. Person-to-person call. Telephone calls used to be expensive. Matt, Matt Weiner, the creator of Mad Men, did this on purpose. A lot of the most important things in my life, he said, have happened to me over the phone. Remember that before texting and voicemails, it's a dramatic situation almost every time when you answer the phone, if you answer the phone, person to person. So I thought that was interesting about changing times. Everyone had a different reaction. I looked at the TV set and just thought that the co-commercial at the end was a nice little musical interlude, just like the show always featured. Didn't think anything of it. Certainly didn't think that the main character, Don Draper, designed the ad. Here's what Richard Bay, a great friend of the show, says. Richard Bay. Am I the only one who watched the Mad Men finale and initially misinterpreted the very last scene? Or could it be ambiguous? I've been kicking myself since Sunday night for not seeing the obvious and thinking that my initial understanding of the scene may have been shaped by my own life experiences and projections rather than Don Draper's. The prevailing interpretation is compelling and obvious, but did anyone else have a different interpretation? I did. And although the actors and even Matt Weiner has, have uh, made some statements, I still see a revolving, years-long debate going on. It's going to be like the Rothko and Burt Cooper's office. We can look into it and see what we want. Even when the initial controversy of whether Don Draper designed the ad or not is solved in your mind, there's still questions that remain over what could have happened to that character afterwards. That was what makes it, of course, a very interesting series finale. 
My sense was simply that playing a Coke ad showed that life had moved on after Don Draper. The industry moved on. Someone else designed the ad. The ad was a nice video audio blend. But uh, gradually, as I've heard more of the arguments on the other side, I've started to lean you know, more away, or at least to think that, that that outcome is possible as well, that after his time in the retreat, Don designs the famous Coke ad. The question after this is, does it mean that Don is returning to the industry that's going to destroy him, or does it mean that he's better now and can handle uh, such a project and continue to work in the agency in a less self-destructive way? Matt Wiener has been pretty ambiguous about his statements. He just says, we leave everybody slightly different. That's all I'm going to say. There you go. It's interesting for the Coca-Cola company because in 1971, when the ad ran, they had a huge response, that time in the form of printed letters and telephone calls to radio stations. This time, after the Coke ad was aired at the end of Mad Men, there was a 991% increase in Coke's digital consumption after the episode aired, according to a Moby Brand Intelligence digital marketing company. That's a measure of how often a term or brand is seen online. There are 21,204 tweets involving Coca-Cola in three hours following the finale. Now, according to Coke, they did not pay for the ad. They say they had limited awareness around the brand's role in the series' final episodes. The ad is called Hilltop, and Coca-Cola has been featuring in tweets and on its website the real story involving Bill Backer. I think that it's interesting to talk about Mad Men 2 in the context of history because Matt Weiner really tried to design a show that was realistic in its time. And for among many things, what I've encountered with some is a reaction that they will not watch the show because of its treatment of women, especially if you look at season one, the pack of wolves that prowl around the office of Sterling Cooper, the women in it treated in a debasing way, maybe annoying to a season one watcher. And in later seasons, the situation changes, it doesn't go so well. For the pack of wolves, the men, the women have their issues during the season, but they seem to do a little better, at least for a time. Makes me think of all kinds of historical issues that he faces, because he made the decision not to tame down how people were acting at that time in, a, in a, what was otherwise a professional office. How do you describe events in history? Do you tame down for today's audience so that they can understand it? Or do you put things in the terms of its time? Now, it's easy to say the answer is the latter, right? No, you have to uh, do history as it was. You have to bring people uh, the events that are accurate, right? But if you do that, I think your audience still applies the values and it can end up magnifying the history, make it seem more dramatic than it would have if you present the history exactly as it was. So that Mad Men office of season one, his history as it was, and it's jarring to viewers today, but would not have been surprising to the average woman, say, working in an office in New York City in 1960. Not that they'd be happy about it, but they wouldn't be as surprised. It wouldn't be as jarring as it is today. Does that exaggerate history in a way? We never lose the present. We're always applying our values to history. You can end up magnifying history if you present the history well. I got people who will not hear a word anymore about Woodrow Wilson. Huge president. Created the concept of a world governing body. A key figure in the fight for child labor laws. Key figure in the eight-hour workday. But I got people that won't even consider him because of his views on race. And that his government, and mostly cabinet members that were Southerners, resegregated the federal government. I do understand people that have that point of view. That's kind of a difficult concept to understand, you know, running history through the present, taming things down so that you don't exaggerate something when it's presented today with today's value, right? Related to this, there's also a numeric way of looking at history, which excites us all and probably is easier to understand because it involves money. And so many times over the course of the series of watching something like Mad Men, there's always this question because it involves a business. 
How much is that in today's money, right? You ask that question a lot. So with that, I have a question. Should Joan have taken the deal to leave McCann Erickson? Now, she was offered $250,000, one half of her half million, if she left the company early. I'd say yes. I mean, she is being offered $250,000 in $1970. That's $1.5 million in 2014 dollars, straight up consumer price index. And it's probably more. But just to put that in perspective, a huge house in 1970 could have been had for $20,000. I mean, the guys are jerks. I hated that actor who played Ferg when he was a frat boy a meanie on Beverly Hills 90210. Well, let's not get into that. Guys are jerks. Going to make her life a living unbearable nightmare. The jacketless, white shirt, machoville of McCann Erickson, at least as portrayed on the series. But the offer is not so jerky. 50 cents on the dollar for getting out early. Many prices are controlled. You know, we've we've over time found out how to get more eggs and milk to people. So CPI is only one measurement. It's the most common, but there are other ways. One of my favorite is share of GDP. Or simply said, if Joan received a $250,000 check, how many... $250,000 checks are available in the United States of 1970 versus how many $1.5 million, if we're looking at straight up CPI, is available today. It's kind of a measure of economic power, what the meaning of that $250,000 is in 1970 versus what the meaning of $1.5 million would be today. Suffice it to say, it was harder to get a quarter mil then than it would be to get one and a half mil now. In share of GDP terms, Joan is about to get $4 million. So, yes, I certainly think she should take the deal. (laughs) Hello, everyone. My name is Wesley Livesey from the History of the Second World War podcast. My podcast is a mostly chronological retelling of the Second World War, starting not with the beginning of the war itself, but almost two decades earlier, to try and determine why and how the nations of the world would find themselves in a worldwide conflict just 20 years after the devastation of the First World War. You can find History of the Second World War on all major podcast platforms or at historyofthesecondworldwar.com. Are you aware the 13 British colonies? You know, the other ones. Florida, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, Quebec, Upper Canada, Barbados, the Bahamas, Bermuda, Jamaica, Honduras, Dominica, Trinidad and Tobago, St. Kitts and Nevis. I received this question, which I find very interesting. Do people realize that there weren't only 13 British colonies? That the 13 colonies that fought in the American Revolution were merely the ones that decided to join? And that not all the British colonies joined the Revolution? Well, I do think it's interesting. I just think there's so much about the American Revolution that most Americans could deepen their knowledge on. This is one. I tend to think that for many, the Revolution consists of Tea in Boston Harbor, Paul Revere, Lexington, Sign the Declaration, Washington's Retreat, Valley Forge, Trenton, Franklin in Paris, and Yorktown. There's so much more going on. You don't hear, for instance, as much about the attempt to woo and subdue the then British colony of Quebec or the attack on Montreal. Of course, people who know their history know these things. But even for avid history readers, I think the Civil War and World War II get a lot of the attention. And the revolution is still a bit of a blur. So there were more than the 13 colonies that revolted against British rule in a formal way. There are many more colonies. In fact, there are more than 13 even, but those 13 are probably the principal non-eastern seaboard um, besides Florida. So there was a larger sphere of British control than just those 13 American colonies from Massachusetts to Georgia. 
and how those areas were reacting should be considered more if you want to know more about the revolution and why it turned out the way it did. That being said, you have to draw a line between the 13 colonies that revolted, again, Massachusetts to Georgia, and the other parts of the British Empire, because they are very different. The parts of the British colonies that entered revolution, the 13 colonies, were the power spear of the Americas outside, of course, of Indian nations. I mean, no one elsewhere in the Americas had any population close. There were 600,000 New Englanders. We, if we constrict ourselves to the British Empire and say, why didn't the other British colonies revolt? 90% of European or white settlers in the British Empire lived in the 13 colonies. So that's just 10%, a little less than 300,000 living in all of the other colonies. And because of the garrison nature of those other colonies, it made it harder for them to join along with the Massachusetts Tea Party or the Virginia revolts. So I wouldn't say that it was an equal choice for these loyalist colonies that didn't revolt, as opposed to the other 13. Most of those colonies were going to stay with Britain. There are probably three exceptions where some form of revolt is possible. The best chance was Quebec, which had just recently become under British control after the Treaty of 1763, after the French and Indian War was concluded. I would add to that two others that aren't thought of much, and that would be Nova Scotia, because of the large amount of New England settlers there, and the island of Bermuda, because of the connection that it had to the colonies, a very strong one we're going to talk about. But in terms of Quebec, where I think there was the best chance, in 1775, it really was on the verge of being, uh, you know, being under American control. Continental Congress sent a force up there under Richard Montgomery, and Montreal was captured. And they did get some support. I mean, hundreds of Quebecers were starting to support the revolution and cast cannonballs in factories for the rebel. And they were really helpful as scouts throughout the operation. One thing that doesn't get much attention is that Continental Congress did authorize two regiments from Canada, both made up of French Canadians from Quebec, Montreal and Quebec. One is led by Colonel Moses Hazen. Now, he kind of goes back and forth as to which side he's going to support. By 1775, he's with the Americans. His unit, the 2nd Canadian Regiment, is going to fight in Brandywine. They're going to fight in Germantown. They're going to be with the Americans all the way to Yorktown. The 1st Canadian Regiment didn't make it through the war. The high point of the uh, Quebecers that were supporting the Americans was the 700 men. And they lost over 150 men in the American cause. Well, this is a Canadian and American bond that I don't think gets talked about enough. Now, so you had units helping there, but there was not a broad movement to help the American Revolution. And I think this is simply because the attacks of 1775 to 1776 were badly coordinated the Americans were not able to capture Quebec, and because of that, the British were able to reinforce in a big way. Once that attack of 1775 and 1776 fails, the Americans are not able to sustain an invasion of Canada again during the Revolutionary War. Too busy fighting the British forces elsewhere. The British garrison Canada, generally, and there's not an opportunity for revolt. Had there been more American control, I think there would have been a broader support for the American cause. So I think the reaction generally to the American Revolution in Quebec and in Nova Scotia, where there's some New England transplants as well, it's not working. This isn't going to happen. We'll just stay quiet and stay with the ones that have the most troops. So the British sent thousands of troops to Halifax and control that area. There was a deeper connection between the 13 colonies that became states, those that revolted, and the other colonies we're talking about. Massachusetts to Georgia colonies shared values, had the same complaints. In fact, to some degree, there was competition between the Maine to Georgia colonies and these other colonies, particularly in the West Indies. I mean, most of the 13 colonies wanted to expand westward. 
But having Yankees in the Appalachians would not have been a desired policy goal for most in Quebec. No matter what latent anger they might have had at Britain over their defeat at the Plains of Abraham. As for the Atlantic and West Indies colonies, there was a good degree of American sympathy in Bermuda and the Bahamas. And Bermuda, which has a connection to particularly to the Virginia colonies, receives all of its food, not from England, it's too far, receives its food from the American colonies. It was noticed in London, the governor of Bermuda is constantly sending reports to the war ministry, help. In 1775, Bermuda transferred barrels of the king's gunpowder to the American colonies to help the effort. There was nothing that the governor could do about it. And then, in order to continue to receive food from the colonies, they continued to support them, particularly providing Bermudan ships and salt. Bermudan ships had fast speed and were able to outrun some of the British gunners. In 1780, Washington considers a plan for taking the island. It doesn't happen, but there's still sympathy in Bermuda. For the other British colonies, it was a greater degree of benefit to stay loyal than for the 13 colonies who revolted. I mean, the West Indies, the Caribbean colonies generally, I mean, there was a lot of uh, voice support for the American cause in the Bahamas, enough to concern London. Before there was a revolution, there was an association and a boycott, and that boycott was directly aimed not only at London, but at the West Indies colonies. Alexander Hamilton, writing a series of letters with a loyalist minister, Sam Seabury, prior to the revolution. And he talks about this a lot because, well, Hamilton was from Nevis, and he understood how the West Indies colonies worked. He said, look, the Americans are going to need to make the West Indies colonies suffer a bit so that the message gets back to London. We're boycotting these islands. We're not doing business with them. And that's going to make them suffer, and the message is going to get to London. So it wasn't a common cause. It was kind of a triangulation of a little bit of suffering for the British colonies in the West Indies that would help the American cause. My point being, Alexander Hamilton and others saw the, the two areas as different places. Hutchinson, Minnesota had some problems. For the adults of Hutchinson, the problem was the teenagers. They kept sneaking off at night to empty barns where they'd brace yourself, dance. Who knew what sort of sin and heavy petting and French literature these barn dances might lead to? No, the adults of Hutchinson, Minnesota did not approve. And neither, it seemed, did the devil. One summer night, Satan himself suddenly appeared in the middle of the dance floor, and the debauched teens ran in fear. He showed up at the next dance, too. For a few months, it seemed like you couldn't go to a late-night barn dance in Hutchinson without getting chased out by the devil, pitchfork in tow. Until one night, when a 14-year-old boy had the good sense to shoot him in the chest. At which point the devil was revealed, Scooby-Doo style but bloodier, to be the local Methodist minister, dressed in a costume and flown in from the roof by rope and pulley. This is The Constant, a history of getting things wrong. I'm Mark Chrysler. Every episode, we look at the accidents, mistakes, and bad ideas that helped misshape our world. Find us at ConstantPodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. This is made clear in Alexander Hamilton's full vindication of the measures of Congress in 1774. But the question highlights something that's really important to know. There's a degree to which the American Revolution was an inspirational exercise, and there's a degree to which some on the continent were bullied, intimidated, or just passively put into revolution against Britain. It doesn't make me unhappy that it occurred, but it's still good to know that history. Because if you see how places like Newfoundland and Nova Scotia, Nova Scotia had a considerable population of transports from New England. They kind of reacted in a passive way. In other words, in Nova Scotia, I think some of the reaction was, oh good, the British are sending thousands of troops from Britain to fight the Americans, so that we don't have to form militias and fight against our former New England neighbors in France. I think the same reaction could have happened in places like middle states, like Pennsylvania and Delaware, if, say, they were located on an island 
and didn't have to worry about the effects of other colonies revolting right next to them. They could have afforded to abstain or sort of say, well, let's see how it goes, and then we'll decide where to join. But Pennsylvania, Delaware, to some extent, New York, have relationships with these colonies that were fervent. I mean, New England, all of those, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, fervent about revolution. Same with Virginia. These colonies are trapped in between, and that, to some degree, restricted their choice because it wasn't an obvious choice the way it was in the aforementioned colonies. Okay, well, here's some TV-related. I just recently started watching the American version of House of Cards on Netflix. Uh, Great show, but I have to admit I far prefer Ian Richardson and the British version of House of Cards from the early 90s. Ian Richardson is so much more effective in the role as prime minister slash killer. And I think this is partially because he's, he's, it's easier for Ian Richardson's character to become uh, Francis Urquhart to become prime minister than it is for Francis Underwood, uh, than it is for Frank Underwood, because of the constitutional problem. I and mean, a PM can step down and there's a search for a replacement of which numerous ministers can join. But in the U.S. system, there's rules. It has to be, you know, the VP who replaces the president. So he had to have events happen to make Kevin Spacey's character the VP. And the stakes are high and he had to become even more ruthless, you know. But uh, in, in, a, in a faster time, you know, it seemed like a, it seemed like events were being pushed that they wouldn't, weren't plausible, right? But I got this question. Has the vice president ever stepped down to become governor? as in House of Cards. So this happens in an episode of House of Cards where the vice president just decides he's not very happy in the administration. He was happy in Pennsylvania, wants to go back to Pennsylvania, run for governor, and will easily win. Has it ever happened? No, interestingly enough, because the vice presidential office is often mocked and made fun of and occupants aren't always happy. But no, it hasn't happened. However... Aaron Burr ran for governor of New York without his president or party's backing. He never resigned the office of vice president, but he would have had to resign if he won. That's about the only thing you can say about it, but let's, what the heck, let's go through the veeps. Adams, Jefferson, Burr, Clinton, Gary, Tompkins, Calhoun, Van Buren, Johnson, Tyler, Dallas, namesake of the city, some think. Fillmore, King, Beckenridge, Hamlin, Andrew Johnson, Colfax, Wilson, Wheeler, Arthur, Hendricks, Morton, Stevenson, Hobart, Roosevelt, Fairbanks, Sherman, Marshall, Coolidge, Dawes, Curtis, Garner, Wallace, Truman, Barkley, Nixon, Johnson, Humphrey, Agnew, Ford, Rockefeller, Mondale, Bush, Quayle, Gore, Cheney, Biden. Couple of them died in office. Elbridge Gary, William King, Harold Wilson, among others. Several of them were governors who became VP. So that situation, the reverse has happened quite often. Cal Coolidge, one of them. And he's starting with uh, George Clinton. Uh, who was governor of New York. Very helpful for the Jefferson administration to have him on the ticket. Daniel Tompkins, same thing. Thomas Marshall was governor of Indiana. Cal Coolidge, governor of Massachusetts. So we've had that. Richard Mentor Johnson, vice president under Martin Van Buren, I thought was the most interesting. He left Washington to start a bar in Kentucky. And I think that's a totally acceptable reason to leave Washington, by the way. Well, it was actually a tavern on an area that the family had a spa for city slickers to come and visit. But while he was building his bar, he never resigned as vice president. I think that's kind of cool, but it's also indicative of what the office was at that time in the 1830s. So it seems that even in the 19th century, when the vice presidency wasn't so much of a fun job, it still tended to be the high point of a career and Going back to the governor's job wasn't interesting enough, at least for most of these people, save Burr, who attempted it, 
to do. I just can't imagine a modern vice president stepping down to become, of all things, a governor. It's just too much of a platform to run for the presidency. And if someone has any political ambition at all, that they'd even want to run for a governor, which is a fairly stressful job in most states, uh, I think they'd want to stay in and have a shot at the presidency. Even though we've had two recents that Biden and Cheney that, well, Cheney that had no interest in the presidency and Biden that doesn't appear to have it, uh, that's not the normal trend. And I think we'll quickly go back to the vice president as the first candidate for the presidency after two terms pretty soon. I want to thank you for listening. The website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. If you like the program, please consider donating. There is a donate button. There's a donate button at www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics and do tell someone else if you enjoy this program. Thanks for listening.